hello there it is bright and early it is very very cold it's not as warm as it was in previous videos and we're going to be doing a return to old school form so we're going to be 100% Ding, plus some washes probably up a Tyranid Harpy this model has obviously already been painted before so we're gonna have to strip it before we start should look absolutely amazing love the shapes on these any kind of flat bird like thing uh, with stepped armor feathers uh, or scales dragons uh, is just perfect for D so um, we're gonna be doing a little bit of TLC as far as the big dudes go over the next couple of months I think I would like to paint a more crusher or a grumpy cabbage as I prefer to call them and if you don't know what one of those is it'll appear here right now it's a more crusher but hopefully you can understand it doesn't like a grumpy cabbage anyway big scary monsters who doesn't like them let's jump into some stripping great way to start your day and <laughs> yeah let's just crack on I'll stop waffling we will paint a harpy it's gonna look amazing I have airbrush behind this, but don't worry, if you don't have an airbrush, there is a solid way to do it without it. If you are airbrush priming a model like this for dry brushing, please pay special attention to any spiky or external bits. It's very easy to miss them out and think that doesn't matter. We wanna put down a good coat over the entire thing now, and I say this with caution, but this is actually quite a thick airbrush coat. I'm not just going for a color change here, I am laying down a primer. So, you know, like I said, I'm saying that with absolute caution, don't spoon, you know, like the heaviest airbrush coat or uh, dry brush coat like I'm gonna show you now on this, but you don't want it to be super thin either. We are putting down a layer of protection and proper priming for us to go forth. So, first step on my palette, I've got Zira's Purple, which is gonna be a touchstone classic Tyranid Fair. And then I've got two primers, which are airbrush primers. You could use brush primers if you want, or if you've just got a black and a gray, that'll probably be fine too. So what I'm gonna do here is just, I, I want to make a not too dark base. I'm gonna add purple until I'm happy with a kind of the level we've got here. Take a little bit of that airbrush primer, the gray and pull it in. And just basically get it to a point where I'm happy with the mix we've got. This is one of my older dry brushes. And then hopefully what we should see is how fast it is to base coat by stippling or smushing. So it's thin by definition because it's airbrush primer, which means that you don't need to add as much water, if any. Pay special attention to the bits that maybe you missed with your, um, with your cam primer, but make sure that you get it from all aspects. And what I'll do is just two quick thin coats here, which will add up to one, you know, decently, uh, decent uh, thickness of coat and that will protect our model beautifully for the upcoming stages. In particular we just want to make sure that we don't have a very thin coat on the edges because when we dry brush any sharp edges, some of mine have been sanded a little which should uh, help kind of negate this but we don't want to be dry brushing our previous steps of paint off our edges because we didn't put down a good prime so the edges, the spikes, the pointy bits they're actually by far the most important and the smooth areas it doesn't matter nearly so much. This has actually gone far quicker than I thought, and I think maybe I should have just stipple primed the entire thing, particularly with what I said about the um, sticking out areas. Oh well, second coat. I've got Cadian Flesh Tone in Zerus Purple. Using the dampening pad heavily, we don't want to build up any unwanted texture at this point. We've got a good prime, so we don't need to worry about trying to achieve that. I'm just going to mix a hint of the purple in. Tiny bit of black because otherwise this is going to seem a little bit nuts and we do need to leave ourselves some room to get brighter. So we're going to go all of the fleshy areas. It doesn't matter if you go over onto the other scales, we can base cut them beforehand, but obviously try and keep it to the, the prime spots, so the, the membranes and stuff like that. And we're just going to stipple this right up. We're going for pretty much an all over base coat, but I'm going to start in the middle sections. I want it to be the brightest. And then we're going to gradually fade this out with a stipple towards those membranes. So at the point at which you're happy with how the brush is behaving, how the paint's coming off, you've gone back to the dampening pad, remove some excess, make sure you've got nice smooth, uh, somewhat diluted paint in there. Then that's the point where I'm going to go towards the membranes without worrying about what's going to happen. So I'm going to repeat that all over the model. Don't make these too exaggerated. You don't want like um, complete block to barely any. You want it to be fairly subtle. We can exaggerate these with washes later 
take your time all over and this should already pretty magically by the time that it's done, uh, you know, almost transform the model. Hopefully, as you can see from the first coat, we've already made a huge amount of progress. It's looking pretty organic already. That kind of natural stipple fade is doing a lot of work for us. What we're going to do now is taking the same brush, go to the dampening pad, and I'm going to remove a fair bit of what I've got going on in here, but also keep the moisture levels slightly raised. So we've got less in the brush now. At this point, this is when we can start introducing the dry brush, and this is how we're going to catch the raised areas like this. So we're just going to buff these up, basically. Think of this as like kind of a, a heavy overbrushing uh, first layer step. For a lot of people, two things are gonna happen here which are really frequently done and good things to try your best to avoid. Number one is there will be a temptation to add more of Cadian Flesh Tone. You don't need to see huge jumps in contrast yet. Don't worry, that's coming. Be patient though. The second one, just make sure that anywhere like this, Front facing exactly the areas that you're more likely to miss in the airbrushing base coating stage um, or the even the brush base coating stage make sure you get them from all angles front back top bottom you know I'm not doing the bottom of this one uh, yet for the purposes of the tutorial but we will get there just make sure that you hit all of these areas this is the most important step you want it all over and you want it all over in the right manner so I've said it numerous times don't rush it get it right after this everything speeds up so a couple of things I just wanted to quickly demonstrate on the reverse. Now this painting is more sloppy than the top because it's not the top and I can get away with it. So what I want to talk about here is the principle of how to make paint leave your dry brush more easily. And basically, we all know this from dry brushing flanks of wood on bases or any type of scenery or stuff like that. Basically, you do not want to be running down the object that you want paint to be leaving on. You want to be running across it. What I mean by that is, for example, to pick out these, uh, the pinions, and then the wrinkles, I'll be dry brushing in two different directions. So, number one, let's pick out all these bones. There we go, perfectly picked out. Because they are, they are crossing our path at 90 degrees. <laughs> so quite easy to pick them out in that manner. And then if we want to pick out the wrinkles, up and down. Now, if it's important to hit something from all directions, hit it from all directions, buff it. So with these organic pieces, I'm gonna buff them here. And then all of the chest, it's quite important for me to get into these nooks and crannies as well. So I'm taking some time on this. I don't want them super dark. I'm just gonna be buffing it up with circles. So yeah, across to be caught. And if you want it caught from every direction, do it around. If enough isn't leaving, First port of call is always the dampening pad before we go and get more paint. We're looking for a fairly high quality job here. And the more moisture there is, the more easily stuff will leave. Also, it will make sure that our brush doesn't get completely caked. This is why I can still work with the same brush for an entire paint job because cleaning and painting are the same thing. Heads come off. At this point, it's just going to be far easier to gain access to it. So I'll show you this. Obviously, the head's an important part of the model. So we're going to make sure that we do things on a high level. The first coat is just the same heavy heavy stipple dry brush that we've approached all of it with. Make sure that we're using some dilution there. Keep it smooth, keep it high quality. And we're gonna lay a good foundation. All these principles are universal, every single part of the model. And if you wanna hit recesses more, more poking, less stroking, and vice versa. If you don't wanna hit the recesses, you wanna leave areas shaded, then only buff and dry brush, no poking. No prizes for guessing what the next step is. We're just going to add more Cadian Flesh Tone to our previous mix. So we're pretty much leaving the black behind here. Uh, do be careful, it is quite a big step up. You've got the purple to keep um, the, co the coherency. That's going to be our unifying color. So let's pull together these. It's going to look very bright in comparison to what we have been working with. Very light, rather. Hold in mind that using the same brush is going to keep a little bit of our previous notes kind of going on there as far as coherency goes. 
keep it dilute. And as ever, we're going to test this somewhere that matters a little bit less than elsewhere, which is going to be in the middle of a section where it's going to end up bright anyway. So we're looking pretty good here. That's not fleshy enough for my liking though. Really work that in. Do hold in mind that when you're working fast on a big model with a big brush with a large amount of paint, you're just going to need a little bit more water or rather you'll, you'll lose water faster from the dampening pad. Okay, so with caution. I think actually we can, we need to use a lot of dilution, but we can be quite brave with the color. So I loaded that fleshy mix in there and we've got our key slow flesh to add in soon as well if we want to. There we go, it's going to be able to build that up in exactly the same way and uh, yeah, we can rock on. You'll notice that I haven't done the dry brushing step yet. That's on purpose because we're actually going to interrupt our own sequence here and bring some washing into the equation. Because I involved black in the earlier stages on this model, it's a little bit washed out. It's more washed out on camera than it is, I think, if I put it against a different background, um, that would be more evident. But still, I do want to introduce some vibrancy here. I could have maybe used a higher percentage of purple. In fact, I definitely think I could have and got away with it easily in the first steps. A bit late for that now, so what I'm going to be doing is reintroducing it with a bit of a wash. We're not just washing because of that. We would be washing regardless, but I will be ramping up the purple a little bit. So I'm going to start with Magos Purple. You can see I've already tested it here on my palette. With flesh colors, this has got a lovely warmth to it. Really, really like it as a color. So we have two, three big scoops of that. It's quite a large wash mix that we're making up. Now into that, I only use a bit of this, but that's only because I don't know where I put my Dreechi Violet. So I think three of these equals one big brush scoop. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's one to one ratio of those two so far. And then we're going to get out a Lamian. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's a one to one to two ratio of the wash, the contrast, and then Lamium medium. So it looks like it might be about right. I'm just going to test it somewhere sneaky. You can test it here first. And I'll find a little nook or a cranny I can scroll some away in on the model. It's a bit more washed out than I would like. That's not going to achieve what I was going for. I guess it's time to bring out the... Uh, a heavy hitter, so we're actually going to just drop some normal paint in there. It's looking a bit better, but we're going to need a real heavy hitter, so I'm going to go and grab an ink. So you could just use whatever is the strongest purple you've got. This is the strongest purple I've got. One, two. So they're small drops, so I think that's about equal to our brush scoop. Yeah, there we go. That should do it pretty much perfectly. Hopefully I've not over-egged it. Test it here. Remember, it is always going to be darker on black. Yeah, we're perfect. So. Wow, that stuff is potent. So what we're going to be doing, I might introduce a little bit more contrast medium to the mix. Oh, I need to wash this brush. Oh. So I'm going to wash this brush so it's not got bits in it. Hopefully I've not put them in our mix, which I probably have. Uh, but we're going to wash the entire thing with this mix. Uh, we're not just going to do a flat wash. We are going to encourage it to 
pull in the recesses and behave nicely. So we're going to direct it, push it into those recesses, pull it off the raised areas, and we're going to hit up the entire thing with that just to reintroduce those purple tones solidly throughout. It will also just help shade details. It's wonderful for this. Okay, so we've put three more scoops of contrast medium in there. Uh, at this point, there's only one way to find out whether what we've done is a good idea. This bit's actually looking okay. <laughs> After all that, maybe I didn't need to do it. We've got quite a strong mix, as you can see on my hand here. And we are going to be taking great care. We want to hit every part of the model with it. And we are going to be directing it towards the recesses. I'm going to separate the model top to bottom. So I'll do the top bit and then I'll do the bottom bit. You are going to have issues on the edges. That's pretty much unavoidable. Just take care around them. Don't oversaturate them and be careful of kind of just stuff sneaking around or overspilling, particularly given that we've got a model that is literally full of holes. As an indication of what happens when you do a wash carefully and slowly, ignore this butter here, I'll explain that in a second. Carefully and slowly we've got here, and then on the rear side, if these streaks and stuff like that looks familiar to you, I, I've used the same wash on the same colours, basically in the same manner. I've just not done the cleanup step at the end, and um, that's been the difference between this level and that level, so yeah. <laughs> Take your time, literally, you know, like two minutes more per side would have made a bit of a difference. This one here just went a bit heavy, so should have gone lighter. Two thin coats, always the way. That's not news to anyone here. This is from me blowing a bubble through from the rear and it's splashing and me not realizing. What I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna introduce some stippling to the darker sections uh, with the same mix that we used for the wash. So that'll be perfectly coherent. I just poured off the excess into this and uh, that'll add in some kind of organic patina stuff and then we'll do some traditional dry brushing. So far less of the stippling, much more of the buffing. Using a super special brush here, this is my very old four, which now gets used for texture paint, horrible stuff like that. And to poke it from the end until it looks particularly unhappy, test it somewhere dark. And you might notice me doing this with my dry brush when I do it as well. I tend to change orientations while stippling quite a lot. The reason for that is your brush will have a pattern, even if it's quite a random one, and you don't want to replicate that because the human eye picks up replication super easily. So if you keep it at the same orientation for all of your, your dots, you'll end up with like the same horseshoe shape or splotch or something replicated, which isn't quite ideal. So I continuously change mine round and that just increases the chance that it isn't recognizable. The other thing you can do is just go along, just to make sure that you've not systematically dotted like every half centimeter or something like that, go and just break it up with some purposely random stuff. Uh, the other approach is to go all over the place and then just fill in the gaps until you're happy. Either of them is completely valid. It's just whichever one works out the best for you, basically. This is quite fun, just take your time with it. You can dilute it if you want, you can use different colors. You know, I could add a red into this and do the same thing and mix it up, still might do that, but I'm just gonna take this all over in those recess sections and hopefully it should bring in quite a bit of character. When these are dried, they will look a fair bit less over the top. If I can just jet wash one now. No, still evident, but not nearly so over the top once they're done. Obviously be careful not to go too far into the middle, otherwise it'll be very obvious what you've done. We can buff out any mistakes though, so don't worry too much. Okay, so I've just done a little experiment here. I think you actually wanna be using an XL for this. Um, the bristles are longer and therefore softer, and for various reasons, I think that's gonna work out better on a surface area like that. I use a large for that, it's still fine, but I think an XL is gonna give you the best result. Where do we start with this? So essentially, we are just gonna extremely carefully buff up the lot, concentrating on the raised uh, middle sections, on the on the top of the wings at least, and we're going to be going through our already existing base coat, and then I've gone up to Screaming Skull there, and we've got a little bit of, I think it's, yeah, it's Kiesler Flash on the palette as well. Still involving a little bit of purple in it, same Xerus that we've been using all the way through, and bearing in mind that we have actually brought, we've brought the, the colour level down quite a lot here. 
stop fairly carefully in the middle. Streaking. It's worth getting it right here. It always takes me longest the first time. So subtle is absolutely fine. And that's why I said you want to be using the XL. It's a bigger, softer, longer bristle brush. And we're going for the subtle effect from that. I actually think that that, that one's probably going to be the worst section of the top. Um, and I think that's down to the longer, comparatively slightly more stiff bristles, at least for a big, large, ultra organic area like this. So hopefully what we're going to do is keep all of that history behind, all that natural blotching and kind of random pattern stuff, but start picking out things in a, if it sticks out more, it gets more paint manner, just normal dry brushing. So generally speaking up and down because these have got striations across them. So that's it. We'll continue with that. And then we can involve a little bit of our next color if we wish. Then hopefully you can see this starting to appear. And it should look hyper natural. Um, you know, even if it is a little bit alien, we should be aiming our way towards something that looks at the very least, very, very organic. Now I'm just gonna involve a little bit of the screaming skull. Carefully with this stage, start on the edges. and then bring it to the midsection. So hopefully that's looking very much alive, um, you know, like a, a big scary beastie, um, but it's, it's still an alive, uh, if alien one. So I'll do that all over all of these panels. This one and this one have ended up matching fairly well, or this, this one's got a slightly drier finish. So I'll try and bear that in mind, keep it even, and we'll, uh, we'll finish this top lot off. So we are looking pretty tasty here, really, really coming to life. There's a huge amount of nuance going on here. Some of it is down to mistakes. We got this little section here. We had that blotch from the wash where it wasn't very well executed there. But if you get in close, the variation is, is pretty high uh, in all of these sections. We could have been way less subtle, the blotching. You know, you, you obscure so much of it now that it really doesn't matter. What I'm doing at this point essentially is I'm onto pure screaming skull using my dampening pad a lot, keeping stuff very, very, very soft, very dilute. Using the same section on my palette, you can see how I've worn it through. So even though I've put paint on it, it's still wearing through to the back. I'm taking off a huge amount of the paint. And then this is completely into like buffing mode. Any areas I want to be lighter or brighter. So the edges, the wings or sections around the circles, the holes in them, or just bringing up the middles. I can absolutely do. Another thing which I'm doing is where it's darker at the edges, you get really nice contrast if you hit these places up. So for example, this section here looks quite nice because it gets way darker. It's a deeper purple here, but then we've still hit just the raised areas with this step. So we're getting all of this. This is like any painting. If you take your time, you will just get a better job. So there are some areas on this that aren't perfect. We've got a little bit of graininess, particularly on this section here. Um, and this section here, I don't know what it is, maybe it's something about their shape or something like that. But if you dilute more, go slower, use thinner paint, just like if you spend more time edge highlighting, you'll get more perfect results. You get more perfect results doing this. For the time that's spent though, that is really, really good. Uh, on the table, that's gonna look nuts. And we haven't even done our additional sections yet. Just as a final highlight, what I'm gonna do is take a bit of the Screaming Skull and a little bit of Ulfon Gray. I just want something off-white. You could use pallid witch flesh, you know, anything, you know, an ivory color, something like that. Just something that's a tad brighter than the Screaming Skull that we've been using. Work off a load of the excess. Always starting on the edges because you want them brighter anyway, just to see how it's going. And pick out some of these sections here. The biggest thing is to never go down to your model with a big wet brush that has too much um, too much uh, wet paint on it because that's going to do something irreversible. You can do as many thin layers as you want without it particularly having a negative result. But as soon as you go once with a big hefty splodge, that really does take some fixing. So take your time, don't rush it, test it on your palette, test it on your hand, whatever it is. And uh, you should get some pretty swanky end results. This is going to really hopefully take us to a, a next level set of highlights. I'll go back and do it once more. 
but because this is only hitting the raised areas and it's not opaque, we're leaving a lot of the history. And this is what you want to use this technique for. These are the same color as the wings. I quite like it, but they should probably be a different color. Don't quite know how I'm going to handle that, honestly. Um, probably, if you wanted to keep the dry brushing, you could mask. It's not that hard. They're kind of straight sections. So piece of tape for this bit, piece of tape for this bit, piece of tape for this bit. I have a think about that, but <laughs> we're going to avoid the issue. And we're going to sort out his rib cage now, which is one of the most important parts of the piece. So we're still going to be keeping some of the purple on the go, but we'll only need a very small amount to have a pretty significant effect on our screaming skull. Changed our water because it got very heavy duty use. You don't want any contamination making its way into bone, even if it is of the right color. So start off more gently than we need to. And uh, then we'll just uh, have a look how it's going on and work way up from there. So definitely too gently or too diluted rather, rather than too gently. That's not correct. So we can see how it's going to behave. I'll make the, make the most of this. The brush is a bit wet. So using it all over will help remove that moisture if we've over egged it, which we did. And also we want a little bit more of that bony color in there in proportion to the purple. So this should be a bit stronger, a bit less wet too. That's looking good. We're after quite heavy coverage here. This is an overbrush, so it's going to take a while. Be patient. If it takes multiple layers, go for it. You don't want to be working and rubbing off the same stage. So just like normal painting, people always say that they're very different. They're not. Use the same techniques and everything in this hobby, I, I believe strongly. So we're going to put down one thin coat and then we're going to put down another thin coat. I'm sure everyone's heard that before, but mostly with layering and traditional painting, it's no different with this stuff. All the principles are kind of core and can be used across all the different techniques, airbrushing, dry brushing, layering, whatever. You guessed it. We're just going to increase the proportion of screaming skull there, gradually leaving the purple behind. And then we'll pop in a little bit of a white or an off white towards the end. Not quite decided yet. We'll see how things are looking. It's quite important with something that's got all of these different angles on not to use your strokes just in one direction. I already said it, but you know, if we want to catch these bits here between the ribs, whatever they would be, we need to be going from this direction. However, so we don't get drifts like this one building up just from one direction, we need to buff. So keep your strokes mixed up. Buffing is never a bad idea as far as dry brushing is concerned, unless you know you're trying to catch grains in wood or something like that, or the pinions on these wings, um, pinions, the wrinkles. So uh, yeah, make sure that you approach it with a fair amount of care and just patiently build it up. It's going pretty fast anyway. When I say patient with dry brushing, you know, you mean three minutes instead of two. It's not exactly a big deal. There's two things in dry brushing that tends to cause chalkiness. One of them is putting on too much paint in your previous layer. Both of them are about previous layer. The other one is about not having uh, hitting somewhere with the current layer without it having been hit enough with the previous layer. So there's too much of a step up in terms of color. So if you think of black going through to a light gray highlight and use a dark gray and a medium gray in the middle, if you were to go straight from uh, black, dark gray, miss out medium gray and go to light gray, that light gray is going to look really stark in contrast. So if, if stuff does go wrong, that's one of the ways in which it can go wrong. And the way to ensure you don't do that is just to do a kind of a final pass wherever you are before you go to your next step and just make sure that everywhere you want to hit with your highlight has been hit with your previous layer. If you do find somewhere that hasn't been done, don't just try and push through with the current layer. Go back, step back to your previous layer, make sure it's not been missed and then go on with the current layer. Hope that makes sense. Anyway, I, um, I found a few bits like that in mine. So they've been fixed and hopefully, despite the fact that this layer has got some white in it, it lands okay. The, um, the stripping didn't go quite so well on the bottom of this model, but I think we should be good. And this stuff should end up looking quite nice and kind of classic tyranny, bright bone white. Another thing you can do is use paints that don't have particularly good coverage when you're getting through to the final steps. So rather than using, a, you know, bold titanium white from Proquil, which has got crazy coverage for white, I'm just going to use white scar here. That's absolutely fine. And I'll before rather than taking it to the model and then going to dampening pad, go to dampening pad first. I'll ensure that what's on there is minimal and is diluted. Oh, 
no. Oh no. Oh dear. Uh, and this is why people like dropper bombs. Great. Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> luckily it's on the underside. Oh no! You're kidding me. Oh, GW bottles. Bloody hell. Well, I'd say this is for the outtakes, but this is going to need fixing. That is dreadful. We'll try and buff those out later. This will be educational. Grim. <laughs> My God. All right. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that, because I didn't particularly. We're going to move on to the carapace. So. Just a, a quick note here, I've got two different blacks on my palette. I've got the purple that we've been using. Um, this is the black that I use for base coating. So I'm going to use this to mix up basically uh, as close to a perfect match to the color we've already got here as possible. And I'll use that to base coat the areas on the model uh, that have been picked up by, by the overbrushing. That's fine, you know, there was never going to be anything we could do to control that. So I'm just going to try and pay, make a perfect match. Uh, people think the blacks are the same, they're not. Um, so I'm going to stick to the same paint that I used to base coat the model, even though it's not strictly a layering paint, it's a priming paint. That won't make a, a you know an issue or a difference for me. So just for coherency's sake, I'm going to take it, and then at least here we've got a mix that I can replicate over the rest of the model. So I'll test it out by just checking it here. I'll let it dry. Uh, that looks like it might be a bit dark. Um, if I can't match, I'll just base coat this with that and then base coat the rest of it with that. But we're going to base coat all the uh, chitinous uh, areas, the, the scaly hard stuff, and then we can rock on with the painting of it properly. So it wasn't quite the same, so I'm just going to base coat it. Not an issue whatsoever. Got a nice big fat brush on the go here, size five. So it will take no time at all, and I'll whisk that over all the areas that are relevant. We've ended up a fair bit dark, but that's okay. These things actually pretty much start at black in the paint jobs and then go to purple only at the edges. So we're going to do our best to do some super subtle dry brushing here that catches predominantly the edges so no stippling for that reason hopefully we can still have the dry brushing catch on these lips we'll uh, we'll see how it goes i guess same brush that i used on the white and for that reason rather than padding in my dampening pad with my finger i'm going to do it with my brush and while it's fairly wet i'm just going to make sure that there's no little grains in there or bits of white because obviously they're going to show up you don't want any flex appearing in a largely black piece from you know pretty much a uh, a white dry brush that we finished up on. So see how this goes. Carefully uh, go back here because we removed a bit of the moisture and ever so carefully on an inside bit that doesn't matter, I'm just going to grab a little bit of this purple, mix it with the black, work a huge amount of it off, soften it up with some moisture, work some more off, you know, better too little than too much. Then we're just going to go somewhere that really doesn't matter, which is inside here and see how it's behaving. Looks to be okay. So at this point, we can take it to the edges. I do mean the edges here. What I'm looking to do, even this is the fat highlight, the pre-edge highlight that GW do so well in their, their edge highlighting process. Even if this doesn't look particularly uh, obvious, you will notice if you look really close, hopefully the camera can pick it up, it will struggle though. I can just about see this in perfect light with my human eyes. Um, it is putting down a highlight towards the edges of this piece and that's all we're going for you, you literally you want to aim for something you can barely see which requires a fair amount of discipline but we will be rewarded for that very shortly because this is going to hopefully achieve a really solid end result the next step we're just going to be using pure purple and again we're going to be keeping this fairly careful i'm still using the extra large which for for something of this size is fine of course if you're doing a more delicate one you can step down and brush size so again, with regards to keeping everything super soft and super high quality, take the initial moisture from the dampening pad, using it to clean the brush. This will also make sure that, you know, those bristles are, you don't want them wet, but you want them not dry. And that will definitely achieve that. And we're carefully gonna grab some of our purple. Work it in from all angles. You're basically working it in and then working it off. OK, 
carefully take a bit of moisture. So I'll try and hit edges first. I'm actually getting a really decent quality edge highlight there. Um, we'll hit edges first, and then once we're more happy with how it's behaving, we'll go to the other areas and buff them up. That's going really well, actually. Why have I not done this before? That's so good. <laughs> this is, um, hopefully it's showing on camera. It's quite difficult with dark highlights on black, but um, this is really, really high quality stuff. So uh, super pleased with how it's looking. What I'm going to do now is just basically go through the colors that we've used on these wings. It's going to be super hard to do and try and buff out and minimize these stains uh, to the best of my ability. I was stuck 50-50 between that and trying to, you know, put a wound there or something. It was an excuse that they were different, but um, we'll go with trying to fix it roughly. I don't expect this to go perfectly, but we will do our best. I am actually pretty positively surprised by that. I've not quite made it seamless. Maybe I could put a wash transition here to mimic the wash that I've kind of put a line through with the buffing. But overall, squinting from 3 3 of a, it's, uh, it's fine. It's acceptable. All right, finished Harpy. Yes, I'm aware this flying stand is strange. It was uh, made for something to be really leaning forwards very, very aggressively. So this has turned out really well. Let's pop him off for now. Does look much better on it though. A um, couple of obvious things to note, we could have been way more obvious with our blotching or our stippling or we could have just skipped it or we could have been really lazy and just kind of blob some colours down and it wouldn't have mattered if we were neat or not. It's only just about shown through in a couple of places so um, I, I don't think it looks bad or anything but I'd like to make it more obvious so it has a more evident effect on the final paint job. Uh, probably, you know, maybe you could go white with the blades or something or even like some cool green off green or some strange opposition color to this that was mega efficient super enjoyable as well and uh yeah final paint job overall is pretty striking and um it looks as organic as we were setting out for so let me know if you think it's worked out well uh, one of these has been highlighted more than the others uh can you the eagle-eyed people among you tell and is it is it better or worse i think maybe it could have been a bit more subtle with it but I do quite like the fact that they look really, really stretched tight. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Here it is. That came out really well. Really pleased with it. We didn't necessarily do everything perfectly there. Like if you were after just nothing but raw efficiency, you could skip the stippling step altogether pretty much. It wouldn't matter hugely. And you could skip the penultimate highlight. Uh, you could base coat by a rare brush. You've got that available to you and stuff like that to speed it up. And if you wanted to dramatically improve the quality and the smoothness of this, just do everything we did, but go, you know, like, just take your, take your time, be super careful, go one third slower, and you would get an insanely smooth result on the dry brushing. Our dry brushing has gone really well, and we were going for speed. So absolutely, there's some improvements that you could get there. So really, really enjoyed that. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, we have never featured Tyranids on the channel before, and have been asked quite a lot. So. Uh, sorry it took us so long. I hope you like it. If you did, give us a like, hit that subscribe button as well, and hit the bell notification to be notified of future content. And if you'd like to see these techniques used on another model in the future, on Archeon or on something Nurgle, then pop a suggestion down below. We'll take note of it and uh, we will get to dry brushing some more big stuff fairly soon. I'm feeling quite monstery. I do have a grumpy cabbage uh, in the cupboard and there is an upcoming orc release, hopefully, finally fingers crossed. So uh, maybe I will dry brush up one of those, which I would love to, because I like, I like dry brushing scales and I've barely done it for years actually, don't know why, but uh, who doesn't like a good dragon, especially a grumpy one. So thank you very much for tuning in. I will catch you in the next video.